And we would not be exhaustive for one reason, time, and secondly, because we want you to read the book. Okay, so um, going to the field and coordinating very complex research projects such as we have released today, um, no need to say it's a very daunting task, but the good news is that we are having the result already with us. But I wanted to just speak to a few issues that actually we encountered and enabled us to really get well informed doing this kind of research. Number one would seem to be obvious, but in fact, outside this continent, that is not very obvious. And this is the idea of using Africa as a unit of analysis. So it is one thing to say we're doing research, open African innovation research, and then the question becomes Africa. And for most people in North America, I dare suggest, think of Africa as a country without knowing, seriously, um, this is not just a hype. Um, without actually knowing how complex our continent is. And so when we do this kind of research, and one of the reasons and one of the, one of the struggles we underwent is actually how to understand the continent that is the subject of our study. And we have been confronted with a lot of complex issues about people, geography, language, culture, nuances, and so on. But even then, we also noted seriously that there are still some similarities and commonalities that this continent of huge diversity of peoples and cultures, traditions, and histories uh, constituted. But we paid attention to that so that we do, we do not want to replicate the stereotypes. Again, the next issue to talk about is the concept of innovation in Africa. We, we tried to disassociate our project from the matrix question which we have challenged, as you saw while Tobias was speaking earlier on this uh, morning, that measuring innovation in a very complex society and rich traditional heritage in Africa would definitely not be one that will subscribe to the idea of counting the number of patents per head or using probably the firm or the company or the individual as the unit or the default for innovation. And innovation happens in Africa in very complicated and complex processes through family and social units, through traditions and cultures of people on nodes and even apprenticeships and schemes that are really not ones that you can definitely recognize through this formalized metrics of measuring who is innovating and who is not innovating. So using those methods could be very misleading and it could set up a race that Africa is not competent to compete in or it can also be very counterproductive. So we noted that and that we therefore began to challenge some of those presumptions. But more importantly, the innovation that happens in Africa is not what we call the frontier kind of innovation, the eureka kind of innovation, the breakthrough kind of innovation, the ones that invent the internet and launch the space rockets. We have innovations that speak to the daily necessities of people that are underprivileged people that try to strike two stones together in order to light up a match, not like pulling something and putting it under these very beautiful places in North American kitchens and European kitchens. We are talking about market women coming back from the stream and trying to light up a candle in order to set up fire. This is inno innovations of necessity driven by pragmatism. It is not you know, innovations of trying to see who will be the first to put the rocket on the moon, and even when the population is starving. So our kind of innovation is pragmatic, is inspirational. It is not one that is based on hoarding knowledge. It's essentially one that is based on sharing knowledge, knowing as the wise people have said, that your light does not go off because you lit my own. It only makes the place to be brighter. And that is the reason we've been talking about African innovation in the context of openness, in the context of collaboration, democratic participation, and knowledge exchange. So we have been able to really be well informed 
concerning the kind of challenges that Africa faces. But more importantly, this kind of discoveries that we have made on the field, they help us to begin to now pay attention to those binary classifications of the kind of innovations that happen in Africa, talking about us as a collective society, people do everything communally, and stuff like that. To some extent, that can be true, but it's not completely the true picture. So in Africa, because of the diversity of the people, and even the asymmetrical economic, cultural, and social relations across countries, and these are boundaries that were created arbitrarily, without recognition to the cultures of the people, their languages and their systems. So because of that, the level of development, for example, in South Africa could not be compared to one in Sierra Leone and other places. So we begin to see some of those challenges. So to now take a particular people and say they are collective societies, they do things communally. Yes, to some extent true, but not completely true. So what we find that those binary classifications about Africa, they do not hold water. They do not even stand up to the least of rigorous scrutinies. And so we begin to learn a lot that Africa has so much to offer. It is not a continent whereof we'll be talking about modernism, and we're talking about tradition, we're talking about development and developed, talking about collective and individual societies, no. All of these are represented in Africa in the way innovations are made. And so we have approached this project with some degree of humility and trepidation. We were very willing to learn in terms of what we can find on the ground. For the first time, I dare to suggest, even as somebody working in this area for quite a while, I have, we have been able to be exposed to interdisciplinary network of researchers, each person bringing their own disciplinary perspective to the field, and we were able to see intellectual property and how it actually interacts with the realities of African innovation. And so at this point, I will just not be exhaustive in terms of what we have found and what we have learned, and I'll leave it to my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Jeremy De Beer, to, to, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. What Chidi began his remarks by pointing out in respect of Africa as the unit of analysis may beg the question as to why we chose to focus on a pan-continental analysis, or rather whether a pan-continental analysis actually has any focus. And it's been very difficult to distill three years of fieldwork, empirical research that has been done in nine different countries on the ground by a network of dozens of researchers. These researchers have conducted literally hundreds of interviews and analyzed the results from literally thousands of survey responses and obtained very rich quantitative data and qualitative understanding of the significance of that data throughout the continent. So why would, we, why would we do this? And, and one of our motivating factors was to demonstrate the diversity that exists in all of these areas. In one respect, we unravel or unveil diversity in different kinds of developmental visions. So some of the chapters focus on high-level, state-led, bureaucratic visions of what development means what innovation is, and what intellectual property policy should be. Other chapters in the book, however, focus on community levels or industry levels. So we looked at the biofuels industry in Mozambique and in Egypt. And we looked at textiles in Nigeria and Ghana, uh, uh, cocoa in Ghana, and coffee in Ethiopia, and uh, the traditional knowledge commons in the context that we've, we've just been discussing in the last panel. And other chapters deal with very grassroots, informal, and I don't want to say ad hoc, but uh, dynamic 
visions of what development is and what development priorities ought to be. So you'll find indications of all of these different visions at the state level, in the industry or community level, and at the individual level in, uh, in the chapters in the book. So what did we distill from all of this research? Well, we came up with a series of three recommendations that policymakers and researchers and private sector actors can take forward. We distilled all of that research into three key recommendations. And the first recommendation is to broaden perspectives. So often we hear about a discussion of innovation in the context of patents and only patents. We know that we need to broaden the discussion beyond patents. We need to dis broaden the discussion beyond copyrights, another area that attracts um, a lot of attention. But it's not just um, switching the analysis from patents and copyrights to traditional knowledge, it's understanding systems more holistically. The last panel demonstrated very clearly how issues that arise within the space of trademarks, geographic indications, branding and certification schemes are fundamentally intertwined with traditional knowledge. Likewise, that's fundamentally intertwined with the issue of trade secrets that we spoke about this morning, a dominant form of intellectual property in the informal economy. So in the book, we, we consciously tried to move beyond any particular silo of intellectual property rights, looking only at TK or only at patents or only at copyrights, because that's not the way that people think about these legal formal mechanisms in practice on the ground. And we need to broaden our perspectives outside of this siloed approach towards intellectual property to better create systems that are useful in practice. Similarly, in terms of broadening our perspectives, Tobias began the day by suggesting that the public and private interests in respect of intellectual property are not in conflict. And we chose to look for illustrations of collaboration, look at collaborative dynamics in all of these different sectors because we had a hypothesis which, we, which, which was affirmed in, in the analysis at the end of the day that when we talk about communal forms of protection like the creative commons or the traditional knowledge commons or patent pools or communal certification schemes to brand geographic indications or uh, organic uh, certification or fair trade production, that these are all ways in which IP systems are leveraged to facilitate collaboration, not exclusion, which IP is usually criticized for, for enabling. So by using IP creatively, you can facilitate a kind of co uh, a community. And what we saw is that the communities operate on very different levels. In some respects, these communities are geographic communities, geographic indications being a perfect example. But in other contexts, these communities are cultural communities or spiritual communities, which may or may not be geographically connected. We heard about how uh, traditional healers may come from a particular region, but are actually quite geographically uh, diverse. Um, similarly, these communities may be ideological communities. They may share nothing more uh, in common in terms of geographic or, or cultural identity, but they share an ideology or an ethos, and Creative Commons being a perfect example of that. Or the communities may be economic communities where actors get together to strategically pool, uh, pool patents, for example, for, a, for a, a scientific or economic reason. So these collaborative dynamics acro across um, the continent operate in very different ways. The second key recommendation that uh, comes out of the project, I think, is to avoid harm through intellectual property policy. Africa's in a unique position in being able to um, not merely catch up in, to other parts of the world with intellectual property policy, but rather to leapfrog other parts of the world and to avoid other mis mistakes that other regions have made by reflecting on what other countries or other regions have done well and what hasn't worked. That's a unique advantage in an environment where there's a more open policy environment. But that creates an eagerness to not just catch up but leapfrog other, other countries. That's only a good thing if you've got the right policy in place. There's no point in locking in policies simply for the sake of having some policy, identifying an issue and realizing, oh, well, we need to deal with this. Intellectual property from publicly funded research is important, so let's get a policy. And it doesn't really matter what policy it is. Let's just get one. 
We want to recommend that policymakers reflect on the evidence emerging uh, from field work and from networks such as ours uh, to avoid doing harm by enacting inappropriate IP policies. And very closely related to that, our third recommendation is that policymakers and other actors and stakeholders in the IP system should be thinking forward as opposed to backward. So this book was about uh, documenting current realities using conventional research methods across multiple different disciplines from information science to anthropology to international relations and law and economics, but to document from all those different perspectives what's happening right now. So this research looks at the current reality in terms of a very short window of time, right now to a few years ago. But there's no point in enacting policies to deal with yesterday's problems or yesterday's reality. Our recommendation is to think forward and develop policies that prepare for tomorrow instead of respond to yesterday. And so on that note, tomorrow's agenda is full of um, presentations and discussions and interactivity around scenarios for the future. Um, and so I'll just sort of whet your appetite for that. Tomorrow we're going to be uh, focusing on the future. Um, and for the, the time being, I think we have some time for uh, audience, audience questions um, about anything that was covered today. And, and not, for, not for me, but for, uh, any, for, for anybody. Michelle, I think you're going to facilitate that, yeah? yeah? Thank you very much. Um, I have also um, been listening uh, since morning to the um, presentations that have been made, uh, particularly in the areas of um, uh, the interconnection amongst different uh, issues of IP and how we can move this process forward. Uh, there is one component which I was just reflecting on and I felt probably I should highlight it uh, towards the closing of this session, the, the administration of IP. The, uh, the role of administration of IP in relation to the conceptual understanding of the issues we are discussing, in my view, is very critical. And therefore, any uh, future research endeavors should attempt to link it with the, the, the whole element of administration. Because I was just sitting here since morning, I was just wondering why am I really? Because we have policy makers who have enacted and agreed to certain uh, frameworks for implementation. And some of them have been based on critical analysis. I have been involved in a number of IP policy development where we sit down and analyze policies of government and then synthesize them and use them as a basis for the formulation of national IP policies. So I will propose that maybe without me, me, making a lot of uh, interventions to say that probably in, in our future work, we must try to uh, put the actors uh, in a more uh, concerted framework to get a better understanding of, of what we are you know, seeking to achieve. The other issue has to do with the this a point of uh, 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 commons. I, I think uh, there was a professor from Kenya who tried to raise the issue of what does this really mean? And, and I think at some point, I thought maybe we we're going to get a better understanding and it didn't come out. So maybe as a policy question, we need to really understand what does this really mean? This issue of uh, TK commons, uh, creative commons and, uh, and the like, uh, innovation commons and, and the like, because it touches on the level of development of states. If you are coming from a state where a lot of IP has been used to harness uh, development or to, to, to make a development, you may be thinking that, well, knowledge can be shared and used and then be uh, be, 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 be developed further. If you are coming from another country where there is the question of to what extent did the IP miss our knowledge and how then do we uh, mainstream this knowledge 
for our economic development, then it also becomes another issue. So maybe as a, as a, a recommendation, we should also try to understand some of these commons in relation to the conceptual understandings of traditional knowledge, for example, and then all these issues of access and benefit sharing. Because if we are not very careful, we, we then add on to the already existing uh, challenges that we are facing. Because personally, at this stage, I think I'm living here wondering, did I understand really what was this commons in relation to communal knowledge, in relation to traditional knowledge? And then the question I was also asking myself is that, for example, knowledge creation, epistemology, to what extent is contemporary knowledge different from traditional knowledge, for example? These are critical issues that will shape the intellectual property system in developing countries in going forward. And I think, I, I don't know how to put it in a research term because I think I've lost my research capabilities uh, many years ago because I was sitting here wondering. So probably I would wish to put this on the table for further discussion in going forward. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to once again commend um, the authors for bringing out this book. There's a point that uh, Chidi made which I thought I should um, just make a comment on. And it is not that I'm disagreeing with Chidi, I completely agree with you that um, the kinds of innovations we have in Africa are basic necessity innovations. And to the extent that they are basic necessity innovations, we ought to promote these kinds of innovations. But I believe also that there is a fundamental challenge that has to do with upscaling these innovations that would then make Africa more competitive. And this is important because ultimately, we cannot just be satisfied with the basic necessity innovations that we are having. We would need to go out there and be competitive with the rest of the world. And that has to do with answering the question of how do we then upscale the kinds of innovations we have so that it will make us more competitive. And I thought I should bring this up for further discussion. Thank you. I, I think we ought to be careful about a generalization that we've been making all morning about innovation in Africa. So for example, if you were to study or look closely at the databases of the USPTO or the EPO, you will find Africans by the scores holding and owning patents. So there, there's a little bit of a, of a knowledge and institutional gap. So the innovation happening on the continent, the big challenge is really about not only recognizing it, but I think that research is really about the future. How do we take the great body of knowledge that is in existence on the continent? How do we bring it to a level to which it is visible? How do we transform our regional organizations, ARIPO, API, uh, some of these national organizations as well, so that they become agents of local innovation and so that they become intermediators of knowledge dispensation. That is the critical issue, and that involves not only policy, but also politics. And that's something I assume that people will be talking about over the course of the week. But that being said, innovation by Africans um, that is showing up in other parts of the world needs to be addressed as well. And some of that means that there's local innovation that um, this study has identified that's been transferred to research institutions such as mine, and patents have been received on them. That's really the, the question that Maricela's group um, um, and Helen's group really was studying. And that's a, a question of appropriation, misappropriation, that needs to be discussed in exactly that framework. Um, and so the big challenge, in my view, is not just about upscaling local innovation or even making it more global. It's both. It's about recognizing where the innovation is taking place that has the capacity to make a difference globally, but more importantly, ensuring that our institutions and policies are responsive principally to the local interests of Africans.